From a Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux. Iron. How did they make it? Part 4a. Steal Yourself. This week, we continue our four-and-a-half-part look at pre-modern iron and steel production. Last week, we looked at how a blacksmith reshapes our iron from a spongy mass called a bloom, first into a more workable shape, and then finally into some final useful object like a tool. But as we noted last week, the blacksmith doesn't just need to manage the shape of the iron, but also its hardness and ductility. As we'll see this week, those factors, hardness and ductility, and a bunch of other more complex characteristics of metals, which we're going to leave out for simplicity's sake, can be manipulated by changing the chemical composition of the metal itself by alloying the iron with another element, carbon. And because writing this post has run long and time has run short, next week we'll finish up by looking at how those same factors also respond to mechanical effects, work hardening, and heat treatment. As always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you really like it, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates or follow me on Twitter, at Brett Devereaux, for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. What is steel? Let's start with the absolute basics. What is steel? Fundamentally, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. We can, for the most part, dispense with the many modern varieties of steel that involve more complex alloys. Things like stainless steel, which add chromium to the mix, were unknown to pre-modern smiths and produced only by accident. Natural alloys of this sort, particularly with manganese, might have been produced by accident where local ores had trace amounts of other metals. This may have led to the common belief among ancient and medieval writers that iron from certain areas was superior to others. Steel from Noricum in the Roman period, for instance, had this reputation. Note Buckwald, original citation, for the evidence of this. Though, I have not seen this proved with chemical studies. So, we are going to limit ourselves here to just carbon and iron. Now, in video game logic, that means you take one unit of carbon and one unit of iron and bash them together in a fire to make steel. As we'll see, the process is at least moderately more complicated than that. But more to the point, those proportions are totally wrong. Steel is a combination of iron and carbon, but not equal parts or anything close to it. Instead, the general division goes this way. There are several classification systems, but they all have the same general grades. Below 0.05% carbon or so, we just refer to as iron. There is going to be some small amount of carbon in most iron objects, picked up in the smelting or forging process. From 0.05% carbon to 0.25% carbon is mild or low carbon steel. From about 0.3% to about 0.6%, we might call medium carbon steel, although I see this classification only infrequently. From 0.6% to around 1.25% carbon is high carbon steel, also known as spring steel. For most armor, weapons, and tools, this is the good stuff. But see below on pattern welding. From 1.25% to 2% are ultra-high carbon steels, which, as far as I can tell, didn't see much use in the ancient or medieval world. Above 2%, you have cast iron or pig iron. Excessive carbon makes the steel much too hard and brittle, making it unsuitable for most purposes. Image. Cast iron statuette of a cat. Image description. This is a difficult topic to illustrate. So, since the interest is for cat pictures, via the British Museum, here is a Ming Dynasty cast iron statuette of a cat, 15th or 16th century. Cast iron production 
was discovered much earlier in China than in most of the rest of the world, but cast iron products were brittle and not generally suitable for demanding use. End of image description. I don't want to get too bogged down in the exact chemistry of how the introduction of carbon changes the metallic matrix of the iron. You are welcome to read about it. As the carbon content of the iron increases, the iron's basic characteristics, its ductility and hardness, among others, changes. Pure iron, when it takes a heavy impact, tends to deform, bend, to absorb that impact. It is ductile and soft. Increasing the carbon content makes the iron harder, causing it to both resist bending more and also to hold an edge better. Hardness is the key characteristic for holding an edge through use. In the right amount, the steel is springy, bending to absorb impacts, but rapidly returning to its original shape. But too much carbon, and the steel becomes too hard and not ductile enough, causing it to become brittle. Compared to the other materials available for tools and weapons, high carbon spring steel was essentially the super material of the pre-modern world. High carbon steel is dramatically harder than iron, such that a good steel blade will bite, often surprisingly deep, into an iron blade without much damage to itself. Moreover, good steel can take fairly high energy impacts and simply bend to absorb the energy before springing back into its original shape, rather than, as with iron, having plastic deformation, where it bends but doesn't bend back which is still better than breaking, but not much. And for armor, you may recall from our previous look at arrow penetration, a steel plate's ability to resist puncture is much higher than the same plate made of iron. Bronze, by the way, performs about as well as iron, assuming both are work hardened. Of course, different applications still prefer different carbon contents. Armor, for instance, tended to benefit from somewhat lower carbon content than a sword blade. It is sometimes contended that the ancients didn't know the difference between iron and steel. This is mostly a philological argument, based on the infrequency of a technical distinction between the two in ancient languages. Latin authors will frequently use ferrum, iron, to mean both iron and steel. Greek will use sideros, iron much the same way. The problem here is that high literature in the ancient world, which is almost all of the literature we have, has a strong aversion to technical terms in general. It would do no good for an elite writer to display knowledge more becoming to a tradesman than a senator. That said, in a handful of spots, Latin authors use calypse, from the Greek calypse, to mean steel, as distinct from iron. More to the point, while our elite authors, who are, at most dilettantish observers of metallurgy, never active participants, may or may not know the difference, ancient artisans clearly did. As Tylko, original citation, notes, we see surface carburization on tools as clearly as 1000 BC in the Levant and Egypt, although the extent of its use and intentionality is hard to gauge, due to rust and damage. There is no such problem with Gaelic metallurgy from at least the Latin period, 450 BCE to 50 BC, or Roman metallurgy from circa 200 BC, because we see evidence of smiths quite deliberately varying carbon content over the different parts of sword blades, more carbon in the edges, less in the core, through pattern welding, which itself can leave a telltale streaky appearance to the blade. These streaks can be faked, but there's little point in faking them if they are not already understood to signify a better weapon. There can be little doubt that the smith who welds a steel edge to an iron core to make a sword blade understands that there is something different about that edge, especially since he cannot, as we can, precisely test the hardness of the two every time. He must know a method that generally produces harder metal and be working from that assumption. High carbon steel, properly produced, can be much harder than iron, as we'll see. Image. The Sword of Tiberius. Image Description. 
via the British Museum, the so-called Sword of Tiberius, a mains type Roman gladius from the early imperial period, circa 15 AD. The sword itself has a mild steel core with high carbon steel edges and a thin coating of high carbon steel along the flat. Almost certainly, the higher carbon edge was welded onto the mild steel core during manufacture, an example of a blacksmith quite intentionally using different grades of steel. End of image description. That said, our ancient or even medieval smiths do not understand the chemistry of all of this, of course. Understanding the effects of carburization and how to harness that to make better tools must have been something learned through experience and experimentation, not from theoretical knowledge. A thing passed from master to apprentice with only slight modification in each generation. Though it is equally clear that techniques could move quite quickly over cultural boundaries, since smiths with an inferior technique need only imitate a superior one. Making Steel Now, in modern steelmaking, the main problem is an excess of iron. Steel, when smelted on a blast furnace, tends to have far too much carbon. Consequently, a lot of modern ironworking is about walking the steel down to a usefully low amount of carbon by getting excess carbon out of it. But ancient ironworking approaches the stealing problem from exactly the opposite direction, likely beginning with something close to a pure mass of iron and having to find ways to get more carbon into that iron to produce steel. So, how do we take our carbon and get it into iron? Well, the good news is that the basic principle is actually very simple. When hot, iron will absorb carbon from the environment around it, although the process is quite slow if the iron is not molten, which it never is in these processes. There are a few stages where that can happen, and thus a few different ways of making steel out of our iron. The popular assumption, in part because it was the working scholarly assumption for quite some time, is that iron can be at least partially carburized by repeatedly being reforged. Experimental efforts to replicate this suggest that this is not true. No, Craddock, original citation, 252 on the arguments. The first problem is time. Carbon absorption for hot but solid iron, like an iron bar in the forge, is relatively slow, often taking hours. One experiment suggests about three hours to completely steal a three millimeter thick piece of iron, with thickness increasing the time required non-linearly. But irons are generally left in the forge fire only for minutes, which would mean that even if any carburization did take place, it would have penetrated only an extremely thin layer of the iron. Meanwhile, simply leaving an iron in the forge for a prolonged time is also a bad idea, as it will cause the iron to burn unless the forge is kept at a lower temperature, which would in turn mean not using it for regular forge work in the meantime. Or all oxygen is excluded. More on that in a second. So at best, the forge fire is going to provide only an extremely thin coating of steel over a bar of iron, something like 0.03 millimeters. The problem with trying to make up for the slowness of this process by just going through the forging process over and over again is that you also have two different sources of decarburization. The first is the air. As we saw in our discussion of the roasting process, if you heat up iron, either metal or ore, in an environment with lots of oxygen, O2, in an environment with lots of oxygen, O2, that oxygen molecule will tend to grab spare carbon to make carbon dioxide, CO2. That's still true with our carburized iron that has been heated up for forging. But since our smithy has to be an oxygen-rich environment, on account of our smith's need to breathe, some of that carbon will get pulled out of the outermost layer of the iron. Worse yet, that oxygen is also going to oxidize, that is, rust, that outer layer of iron, which leads to, as we discussed last time, that rust getting dislodged during hammering as hammers scale. As a result, 
careless forging can actually decarburize the edges of a piece of iron. And metallurgical tests on some ancient weapons have seen some evidence that this did happen, where carbon content in the edge was lower than in the core, which is, to be clear, not a desirable situation. Fundamentally, our problem here is oxygen. Oxygen makes the iron burn in the forge, it causes oxidation in the iron, and it steals away our free carbon to form carbon dioxide. So, in order to get our carbon into our iron in quantity, we need to look for ways to get the iron hot in a carbon-rich environment with little to no oxygen present. That leaves two ideal phases for stealing. First, stealing in the bloom. After all, we already have a stage of iron production where creating an oxygen-starved environment was crucial. Can we get our carbon into our bloom during the smelting process? The answer is yes. If the ratio of charcoal to iron ore is tilted heavily enough in charcoal's favor, the end result, once the charcoal has burned down, will be a steel bloom. This seems to have been the case in some traditional African bloomery traditions. Craddock, original citation, 236, and the Japanese Tatarabuki process, Sim and Kaminsky, original citation, 59. Some Iron Age European finds have also been interpreted this way, but my understanding is that there are still many questions here. The documentary evidence provides, as I understand it, no support for widespread use of the bloomery method in Europe. Image, recreation of a small bloomery furnace. Image description. Via Wikipedia, our same modern reconstruction of a basic small bloomery furnace. If the furnace operators were to essentially overload this furnace with charcoal, the oxygen-deprived environment within would eventually carburize the bloom into steel. End of image description. Alternatively, the carbon can be introduced after the iron has been formed into a bar in a process known as cementation also called case hardening or forge hardening, although the phrase case hardening can also mean effectively surface hardening, making it an imprecise term. Once iron is heated above roughly 900 degrees Celsius, or in visual terms, a red heat, it will begin to absorb carbon if kept in contact with the source of carbon in an oxygen-starved environment. And, we actually have a fair amount of attestation as to how this would be done from the medieval period. See Craddock, original citation, 252. First, the iron bars, having been smelted into a bloom then forged into bars, were wrapped or surrounded in carbon-rich materials, which might be charcoal itself or else plants, hoofs, horn, or leather, and then sealed inside of a ceramic casing. That case was then heated to the correct temperatures. Because the interior of the case is oxygen deprived, there is minimal risk of burning the iron, so going high on the temperature is less of a threat, and held at that temperature for several hours while the iron absorbed the carbon. The iron bars used were often intentionally quite thin, one to two centimeters thickness, to allow for more rapid carburization. The result, sometimes called blister steel, might have a carbon content up to 2%, depending on how thorough the cementation process was. Doubtless, long practice led smiths to get a sense for exactly how long and at what heat a given amount of iron should be treated to produce the desired levels of carbon. What is clear is that in both cases, using bloomery processes or cementation, that the fuel and time required made the resulting steel expensive. Talcote, original citation, 278, notes that the steel in the medieval period often commanded around four times the price of iron. Consequently, we tend to see steel and iron objects in use side by side from the beginning of the European Iron Age onward. Craddock, in particular, has examples. Just like how iron was generally only used over cheaper materials like wood, stone, and leather when the job demanded a lot of material toughness at low weight, so steel, especially steel of higher quality, was generally only used in place of iron when the job demanded extreme performance. But of course, not all parts of even a single object demand exactly the same properties. Which brings us to...
pattern welding. As noted above, it was most efficient to carburize fairly thin rods of iron, since the carbon was absorbed through the outermost layer of the iron. Moreover, the process of making steel through carbon absorption, either in the bloom or through cementation, often leaves the carbon levels throughout the iron somewhat uneven, with more carbon in the outer layers and less in the core. One way to manage this, particularly in the production of practical tools, was stealing. We actually saw an axe head produced through a method designed to permit stealing last week. In a steeled blade or tool, the core of the tool is forged in iron, perhaps lightly carburized. And then, near the end of the forging, the business end, blade, hammer surface, pick point, etc., whatever needs the most hardness, generally, is forge welded with a piece of steel, making a single piece of metal bonded strongly together, but with different carbon counts in different areas. This can be done a number of ways. The steel might be used as a core and the iron body welded around it, and then filed away, leaving the steel exposed. More common, I believe, with axes. This was the method we saw last week. In other cases, a steel edge might be wrapped or layered over an iron core. Image. Close-up of a Moro Barong sword. Image description. Via Wikipedia, a close-up of a Moro Barong, a type of sword from the Philippines, showing the streaky pattern produced when a pattern-welded blade is etched and polished to bring out the welds between the different parts of iron. End of image description. If the goal instead was to create a more homogeneous steel, the solution was piling, sometimes inaccurately referred to as damascening. The steel bar is drawn out into a fairly thin rod, then folded back and fire welded into itself, often repeatedly, to create a more homogeneous steel. Though it is mostly now a thing of the past, for quite some time there was a pervasive popular belief that this particular method was unique to Japan. In any event, it was not. The downside, of course, was the time and labor demanded, compounded by the fact that Repeated fire welding meant repeated material loss to oxidation and ejection, especially since, after several pilings, the amount of slag to be ejected was likely to be quite low. More complex is pattern welding, which marked some of the highest quality blades in much of the world until the early modern period, with exceptions for things like Wood's steel, which is not pattern welded but confusingly sometimes equated with a pattern-welded steel under the confusing term Damascus steel, which you will note I effort to avoid entirely. In the basic pattern-welding method, we begin with a thin rod or bar of carburized iron. This is then piled and drawn repeatedly to create a laminated rod of iron with relatively more homogeneous carbon content. Then, two or more such rods are twisted and then welded together to produce a strong steel core. Generally then, a blade, often more fully carburized to maximize its hardness, since harder metal holds a sharp edge better, is welded onto the core to make the final object. Image. X-ray of the Sutton Hu sword. Image description. Via the British Museum, an X-ray of the Sutton Hu sword a pattern-welded 6th century early English sword. The X-ray brings out the wave patterns of the pattern welding from beneath the rust and damage, which would otherwise obscure them. End of image description. Pattern welding was intensive in both time and fuel, and consequently was reserved generally for valuable prestige items. For iron, this almost always meant the blades of weapons, particularly, though not exclusively, swords. Pattern-welded knives, hammers, and spearheads exist, but are less common. Part of the prestige value must have been the high performance of weapons made this way. But, it cannot have hurt that such weapons, if polished and etched, clearly displayed the patterns of the welds, and there is evidence that they were kept in this state. Pattern welding is an ancient technique. Some middle and late Latin are exquisitely pattern welded, which, in Europe, continues through the Roman period and into the Middle Ages, although it is somewhat less common, as I understand it, in the early Middle Ages, as compared to either the Roman period or the High Middle Ages.
The art never seems to have been lost, though the greater availability of either imported woods or larger and more homogeneously carburized locally made steel blooms, using the bloomery process rather than cementation, seems to have caused European sword manufacture to shift away from pattern welding later in the Middle Ages, essentially because it became no longer necessary to ensure a blade of sufficient quality. Of course, pattern welding could be faked, by going through the final steps, twisting, welding, and attaching the blade, without the former steps, or even properly carburizing the steel. Sometimes these blades, pattern welded, using low carbon or even no carbon iron, are taken to mean that the role of the carbon or the quality of the metal was not understood. I do not think this is the case, given that often the carbon content of high quality blades, even as early as the Roman period, seem very deliberately distributed. Bishop and Colston, Roman Military Equipment, 2006, 242, features a chart, not in the public domain, so I won't reproduce here, which shows the carbon content of a number of Roman gladii as a cross-section. Several have high carbon, hard, edges, and lower carbon, soft, cores, which is exactly what you would want in a sword. And coincidentally, also how the highest quality Japanese katana were made, though I should note that these gladii are some 1300 years older than the oldest katana. Instead, I think we should understand low carbon or iron blades with pattern welding patterns to have essentially been fakes or knockoffs, meant to look like a superior high quality pattern welded steel blade, but made using inferior materials or processes. Image. Chart of different katana iron types. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A chart of the different types of iron used in the manufacture of high quality katanas. It seems necessary to note, since this point is often missed, that not all Japanese swords, or even all Japanese swords of the katana type, were made to the exacting quality and carbon counts implied by these sorts of reconstructions. Unsurprisingly, the sorts of swords that became museum specimens tend to be the prestige high-value pieces, of which we have many, since the katana is a fairly late, generally post-circa 1300, sword form. End of image description. Intermission. This was intended to be one long post, but the demands of time have led me to split it here. Next time. We'll look at the other tools that a blacksmith has to control the characteristics of his iron. Work hardening and heat treatment. Which is to say, hardening, tempering, and quenching. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry. The blog of history professor Brett Devereux. Recorded by myself, a great divorce, for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it, or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.